now we have uh, Dr. Melan Shu, who's been one of our cornea fellows this year. She's uh, currently negotiating with a group in Ashland, Oregon, and uh, we've been glad to have her. So today I'd like to present um, kind of this year a lot of the work I've done with um, Dr. Moshevar and Dr. Mifflin on RD6. Um, so I'll start with an introduction, and then two projects that we worked on were one on using a double pass technique to prepare ultra thin graphs and then looking at doing the same with the femtosecond laser and then our outcomes in um, different D6 scenarios. Um, in addition to working on a lot of projects, I also were for was fortunate to travel around southern Utah as well, which has been pretty amazing. So I have a few photos in there as well. Is that? that is um, Zion's at the top of An Angel's Landing. Oh. So um, for some of the medical students, um, endophil keratoplasty is a surgery where instead of replacing the entire cornea, we're replacing only the uh, posterior diseased endothelial cells. And so the method we're going to talk about today is DSEC, and that's where we um, re strip and remove the diseased patient's endothelium and decimase, and then we prepare tissue that has a little bit of stroma and we attach that with an air bubble technique. Um, the other way described is DMEC, where instead of having this, um, the, pa the donor tissue stroma, you're just transplanting the decimase membrane. So there's obvious advantages of endothelial keratoplasty over PK. This is an open globe that I had with Bryce, um, where it was a bar fight patient, young guy who had keratoconus and a previous corneal transplant. He's always going to be at risk to trauma, and so um, his most of his eye contents were extruded. Um, there's so both intraoperative and postoperative uh, complications are higher in PK, and then th the recovery is much longer with PK with months of suture management to manage astigmatism, and um, there's always a risk of suture abscesses and infection. Uh, so DSEC has really replaced um, pen full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, some of the limitations are you do get this hyperopic shift after a DSEC tissue is placed, so we usually aim about minus one when we combine it with cataract surgery. And then also um, it has been noted that some patients just really never get to 2020, even if there's their um, graph looks really, really clear. Possibly it's due to a stromal interface problem, um, but as Dr. Mifflin and I have brought in a lot of our patients, you know, really kind of looking at their astigmatism, trying to get a really good refraction, we get pretty close, but there's still some patients we can't really explain why they're not 2020. And um, so if you look at, uh, uh, this is a DSEC graph, this is at one month, three months, and four months, you see that the graph continually gets thinner and thinner. And at one month, we still have the edges of the graph which don't have decimase quite maybe covering it. So these edges kind of swell up, and then um, it does become thinner, and the vision continues to improve months after surgery. So um, with DMEC, you can, uh, you it's thought you could avoid having this extra tissue. Um, however, DMEC still is very surgically challenging, and studies are still being done to see if, with all the surgical manipulation, if endothelial cell lo loss is higher, and then you also have more dislocation reloading rates. So what we looked at is can possibly a thinner DSEC graft that's more planar um, produce um, less uh, hyperopic shifts and possibly even refractively neutral outcomes. So um, we looked at two techniques in preparing these ultra-thin DSEC grafts. And so this is in the narrows that we hiked and my parents came, so that was really fun. Okay, so in we're really lucky here at the Moran in that the as fellows, we um, prepare all the DSEC tissue arts ourself. Um, and we either, our options currently are we use a 300 or 350 micron keratome head. Um, when, we ha when you use higher, thicker heads, um, there's higher rates of perforation. And really the only way you can really limit how thin your graft is gonna be is either you can do a, a slower pass for thinner grafts or maybe go a little faster. Um, but um, Shamima Sichter, the previous fellow, she worked on this as well, but um, 
the new change this year was that Moria, the company, made a disposable artificial anterior chamber with a rotating guide ring, um, and there's multiple heads, so you have more options. Um, and so you do one pass, and then this rotating guide ring allows you to do another pass 180 degrees away. Um, so this is an interesting patient I had who um, had Ched. She was from Thailand, had pro probable narrow angles when in retrospect, but it was really hard to evaluate her because her cornea was a thousand microns, very edematous. But we went ahead and did a DSEC on her. And that day, the tissue was just very thick. We got like a 700 micron graft. We cut it with a 350 micron head, and the graft was measured with pachymetry to be 400 microns. But we went ahead and did the DSEC, and the next day, she looked great. Uh, the air bubble was like 10%. And then on post-op day three, she comes into the ER with a pressure of 50, and she had like 360 degrees of, of IK touch. Um, and this was her anterior segment, so she had this thick graft, um, so I think she had some kind of odd uh, mechanism of pupillary blo block. Perhaps this graft kind of shallowed the, the passage of aqueous. And an LPI, LPI was done, but then the next day um, her angle started closing again, so we went back and just had to open up the angle. But the graft, amazingly, you can see here, her, um, this is post-op week one, it was 940 microns and the graft was 400 microns thick. And then in one month, it's already half uh, in size. Um, and then at six months, her cornea was a lot thinner, almost 600 microns, but in the graft was about 200. So perhaps having a thinner graft in her, you know, would have really helped her avoid those complications. Uh, this is a video showing the technique that we, um, of this double pass technique. So this is the artificial anterior chamber. Um, and this is Optisol. And this is the uh, cornea button. So there's just two, the first fixation is, uh, doesn't really move when you do the second pass and, and then you'll see the, the guide ring here. And this is all hooked up with um, two lines, one to control the Optisol and another one is linked up to an IV pole that's raised to the ceiling to keep the pressure about 90 um, millimeters of mercury. And so we check four different areas peripherally and we record those and wherever the thickest pachymetry reading is is where we start the first pass with the microferritone. And then we check the thickness and based on um, that we decide which head which size head to use. So here we're gonna start where the pachymetry reading was the thickest, and this is the extra locking device so that you can rotate it the next time. And the first pass is relatively normal, four to six seconds. And then we recheck the pachymetry to decide what, he what size head we'd use for the second one. And so here is the nice thing about the device is that you can rotate it and now you're gonna start 180 degrees away from where you initially started to prevent the risk of perforation. And here we're just making sure that the IV tubing is uh, allowing fluid to recalibrate the pressure. And then the second pass is a lot slower. This is just to create a nice smooth even pass. And our goal when we say ultra thin, we're really trying to aim un under 100 microns of thickness. And so there is the second pass. And we'd put the we didn't we'd put this cap on top before we um, take the tissue off. We do, um, but with our ultrasound pachymeter, it only, it under 100 microns, most of the time you can't get a reading. So that's another problem. Um, 
but I think we're getting a new one that reads on up to 50 microns. And then this part, we just have to be very cautious not to allow the chamber to collapse. And so you we just kind of flip it over. And because it was under such high pressure, we have to release some of the adhesions and then um, and then we would put this in the in the punch, a, a separate tree fine punch, to when we for the graft. So the kind of it's not an exact. Um, you can't just subtract it out mathematically. That you have to give a little bit of room. But this is kind of the nomogram deciding what kind of head. But the first pass you want to estimate to try to have about 220 microns left, and then the second pass, depending on what your pachymetry reading is, um, you, you, you decide what head. And if it's really thin, you can always put a little bit of BSS with a wet cell to make the, the cornea a little bit thicker. So here's some anterior segment OCT images of the first pass and then the second pass, creating a nice uh, less than 100 micron graft. And there's a one that turned out really well. So um, some things to consider. One, this, the second pass can create a small diameter cut. So you want to make sure you can kind of see the edge so you, you tree find or you do a donor punch with the, same, with the right size. And then um, the thinner tissue is a lot, it's not as bad as DMEC tissue, of course, but it's going to be a lot more um, harder to manipulate. So uh, the boost and glide works really, really well. If you were going to try to do like a folding technique, that would be, I think, more difficult. And they have it also a new boost and glide where the platform is a little bit larger so that um, you can insert it a little easier. So then we um, also tried to do some studies with the femtosecond laser and cutting donor tissue. So femtosecond lasers are what we use for LASIK. And um, there have been studies looking at DSEC graft preparation, preparation with femtosecond lasers. The problem is, is that the cornea and the posterior the collagens are a lot loose, are different structure, made structurally differently in that they're more looser, so uh, it's not as smooth of a cut and it's not as predictable. But here's using a 30 kilohertz and 60 kilohertz. Um, there's been reports kind of looking at the smoothness. This is with the microkeratome, it looks relatively smooth, whereas the femtosecond laser, you have a lot more um, stucco like irregularities. Uh, so we um, looked at this, and so we have an IFS, 150 kilohertz laser, so it's a uh, much higher frequency. And looking at different settings, using a tighter spot line center separation or lower energy, we wanted to see if the you could make predictable, predictable um, DSEC tissue. So we had some, um, just this donor tissue from the eye bank that was going to be discarded. And we were all trying to target them less than 100 microns. So here's a video of this. So this is just this is also mounted on the anterior chamber and hooked up to an IV pole to maintain the pressure. And so it's not as it looks different than a LASIK flap because it's going a lot deeper. And now it's going to make the side cuts. You'll see the rims are being cut now. So just using a lot of different variety of settings, uh, you know, none of them were really that smooth. They were all, some of them were a lot harder to lift. There was definitely uh, strong adhesions, um, but this one actually turned out okay. But there's, there was usually there would be like a little tag of tissue that was not cut very well. Um, so we, after we cut each one, we um, imaged it with the anterior segment of CT, and then we had a mass grader kind of grade them as one, two, or three. Um, so this is a microkeratome cut, really smooth. This one was actually a pretty good one from a femtosecond laser, 
and then this was kind of moderate, and then there were some really bad rough ones where you probably wouldn't want to use that for tissue. Um, so the energy ranged from trials of 0 0.4 millivolts to all the way up to two or three, um, several of them perforated. And overall, when we looked at it, tried to analyze it, um, when we used lower energy levels versus higher ones, um, we had smoother tissue. Uh, you know, we had a lot of variability, and a lot of it could be explained by we had kind of better quality tissue that wasn't as thick in this range as well. So, um, kind of the results are basically that, you know, it wasn't very predictable, and <laughs> I wouldn't really use it for GSEC tissue. Um, it, the microkeratome still created the smoothest surface when we compared all of these different settings and all these different trials. Um, so, um, you know, possibly uh, these can be better, the settings can be further modified. There has been other reports looking at this as well. Um, and then the, it's not, it's, all the measurements are the depths reference from the anterior surface, not the posterior, so you'll, you still won't get a very planar cut. And then, of course, you know, the main thing is, does all this ultra-thin tissue really affect outcomes? Is it really going to give you faster recovery and better visual acuity? And that's all been being studied right now. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, how can you really measure the graph th thickness if we can't even um, measure th the thickness with pachymetry? This is one of the ultra-thins we actually did in a patient, and he had a little fluid cleft the very first day and you know the mic the tissue looked really really thin and really good but it's 300 microns here on the very first day uh, we, we, I rebubbled him and then the very next day I just was curious and it already decreased 110 microns but people who are looking at this you know are saying well you shouldn't really measure uh, give a graph thickness until use it on anterior segment OCT like at one month but it's very very variable so it's going to be hard to kind of know what thickness the tissue is and when is the appropriate time to call its official thickness. Okay, so that's kind of those studies. This, I'm going to move over to the kind of our clinical outcomes, if anyone has any questions on those. Okay, so um, this, of course, is at Arches, which is really amazing. Um, so DSEC, there's been tons published, but we wanted to look at our outcomes, and especially in those more complicated surgeries. One of the main indications for DSEC is pseudophagous bullous keratopathy. So we get a lot of patients who have PBK with ACIOLs, they're aphagic, um, or they have a dislocated IOL and they need an ILO exchange. So we um, looked at 109 consecutive um, cases that Dr. Mifflin did um, of just uncomplicated DSEC. So these were, they didn't have a tube or trab, they didn't have a, a penetrating keratoplasty, um, but 53 of them were, were just combined FACO DSEX. And then we looked at all the complicated DSEX that have been done um, by both Dr. Moshefer and Dr. Mifflin and compiled these cases. So four of them were aphagic and two were left aphagic, two had a secondary ILO exchange done at the time of surgery. 14 had an ILO exchange at the same time of DSEC. 10 of these were iris fixated IOLs, three scleral fixated, and one was just a sulcus lens. One had a varicized lens removed followed by a FACO ILL, and then three of them had it staged where they did the ILL exchange first and then the DSEC, and then two had a dislocated ILL, or, well, FACO pseudo, pseudo FACO denesis, but not a, a dislocated lens, and then later developed an ILL, a dislocated lens, and have to ha have that after the DSEC. And then in five eyes, the ILL was, the AC ILL was just not removed, and the DSEC was done. So this is a video um, of a recent case that I did with Dr. Mifflin. And it kind of just shows the t our technique here as well. So we use a four and a half uh, limbal incision, limbal incision. And um, this is showing the stripping of the decimate. In this case, you can kind of make out there is an ACILL here. And we're now removing the decimase membrane. And this is just injecting helon. And then in all our cases, we do venting incisions. Um, so we do four paracentral venting incisions. This cornea was very, very tough, though. It was kind of hard to make them in this patient. And then we remove the helon. 
and enlarge the wound. And here we're loading our tissue onto the boost and glide. And so right now it, the endothelial cells are up. It's, it's putting a little helon on it. And so this part of the surgery, um, everything goes pretty well. Um, we're just now slowly inserting the tissue, taking care you know, to make sure the ACI well doesn't come up. We have an anterior chamber maintainer that really helps. And here we're injecting air and also taking care to make sure it's going in front of the lens and under the graft and uh, putting a suture. And so here, I'll just pause it. Uh, you know, you can kind of see this nice ring around the tissue so you know that the tissue is where it should be and the air is underneath it. And, uh, but it's a little decentered, so we're actually gonna use the roller to um, kind of recenter it here. So this is interesting, we were almost done. And then you'll see one more pass, and if you watch carefully, that pass might have been a little too harsh because the bubble just completely goes away. And um, we're not really sure where the bubble is at this point. Um, so we kind of have to take air out, put more BSS in, and the venting incisions are kind of handy to s see if air is in between the graft. And we're trying one more time here, but again, the air isn't exactly where it should be. And then on this last time, we get it exactly where we want it. Except for now, the graft is still in fairly displaced. So here we're going, actually, we can go through the venting incisions and help move the graft into position. And we're just kind of sliding on top of the graft and putting it, center, centering it there. And then these venting incisions are very useful because we can remove any interface tissue uh, fluid. And this patient did really well. So in these outcomes, our routine DSEX, um, we had a, uh, the visual outcomes of those patients without any ocular comorbidities like AMD or glaucoma, 94% of them were greater than 2040, 30% were greater than 2020, but those are, um, they all had really pretty minimal complications. The complicated DSEX, all of them, except for maybe one or two, had really significant comorbidity, so it's hard to judge their outcomes. Um, but in all cases, they all had um, improvement of vision, except for three cases that I'll talk, or six cases that we'll go through. Um, other complications, so this is our non-complicated standard DSEX. Um, one had a graft failure that required a repeat DSEX, um, but it was only because the, the, patient, the graft had persistent folds. Um, it was donor tissue from a previous, uh, that might have not have been cut properly. It was from a LASIK tissue, a donor tissue with previous LASIK. And then five patients had rejection episodes that all resolved with steroids. One had elevated pressure and one had pupillary block, but no dislocation, no infection, no epithelial ingrowth. Um, whereas the complicated DSEX had a few more um, uh, complications. So detachment, five, five of the 30 complicated had detachments, and in um, two of them it required a, a subsequent PK. So one was an, an 86-year-old woman who wanted to underwent ACI oil removal with DSEC, and in one of her eyes the graft just never attached and she had to have a PK. The other one, it was partially detached and then repositioned and she did pretty good. So. Both her eyes were 2200 before surgery, and then she ended up 2070 um, in both eyes, the one with the DSEC and the PK. The three other detachments, one was kind of earlier on in the um, learning curve, and this one was just a complicated surgery. Also, uh, there was vitreous noted being the wound. The graft, um, after two rebubbling attempts, never at attached and had to have a PK as well. And the other one were uh, detachments that um, were salvaged with the rebubbling. So of all of these 30 cases, three of them had graft failure. Two of them were the ones I talked about who needed PK. And then the another one actually did really well. She had a complicated eye with 
a shallow chamber, two tubes, um, PAS. Um, she was improved from counting fingers to 2060, and then at six months she developed endothelial failure. Um, four patients had pre-existing glaucoma, and then they developed elevated pressures and needed a further surgery. And then five patients, interestingly, had IOL dislocation, um, and then during three of these IOL secondary IOL placement or repairs, there's one patient who had a hyphema that required an almond valve and anterior chamber washout. So um, in reviewing these cases, one thing that was interesting is to consider the role of the air bubble in patients with dislocated IOLs. Possibly that could be um, pushing on zonules and causing IOL dislocation. So two of our pseudoexfoliation patients had to have a subsequent IOL exchange later. And then when is the best time to do a DSEC with these cases? Um, before, so you don't risk doing further damage to the to endothelial cells just with the surgery or waiting until the view improves and doing it later. Um, and then when, is, when do you need to remove an ACIOL? Um, you know, a lot of our, five of our cases, five of the ones we didn't remove, all four of them did really well, only one um, had um, complications. And then uh, the challenges in aphakia and maintaining an air bubble. And then finally, you know, which cases should you just do a primary PK instead of doing another DSEC? Um, but I think with our technique and our success rate, it's, pr it's worthwhile in most patients to do a DSEC. Um, and so this is just one other surgical case. Uh, this is one of the patients who had a previous failed uh, DSEC, and now we're doing her PK. So here we've tree find the cornea, and her DSEC, she has an Ahmed valve here, it's kind of hard to see, but when we remove the, the first, the PK here, the, the, we're kind of looking for the DSEC graft, but we don't really see it there, and then it's kind of interesting, it didn't really separate, and we have to cut it out again here. And now we remove that part of the graph. And this is just kind of a, maybe a poor prognosis eye. Sh she's just very complicated. She has uh, all this PAS that likely contributed to her DSEC graft failure that is to be cleaned out, and there's her almond valve. And this is, when she had her DSEC, the there was an ACIOL that was removed and there's an iris sutured IOL as well here that we have to be cautious of. Um, and we're looking for any vitreous. And there's the tube that's in good position as well. Um, and so we just did her surgery about a week ago, but she's doing very well. Okay, so the last section, <laughs> this was at Canyonlands, which is nice. Um, we're almost done with this presentation, so uh, we wanted, we, in considering how to treat patients with a failed penetrating keratoplasty, um, DSEC has shown to be very effective. Uh, the debate is whether you should strip the decimase or just can you leave decimase membrane and just uh, put the graft in. And so we wrote a, a letter in response to one of Dr Mark Terry's cases, his case series, and you know, he wasn't very the nicest person in his reply where he kind of said, you know, he's done 1,300 cases over 11 years and he has the lowest dislocations in the world and you know, he kind of questioned our techniques. <laughs> So we uh, went back and got a little bit more follow-up, and we've had 26 consecutive eyes uh, for patients who have uh, failed penetrating keratoplasty. And in all our series, none, none of the decimase membrane was stripped, and we used venting incisions in all of them. Um, and we used a boost and glide for graft insertion. So we looked at our outcomes. And a lot of people have reported on this, but uh, detachment rates range up to almost 30%. And there's only been two series where they did not strip um, the decimase membrane. 
So our outcomes were um, endothelial cell loss was about 30%, which is in line with most studies. In our dislocation, only one of them was noted to have a fluid cleft. It wasn't a complete detachment. It was peripherally attached. And so our dislocation rate, one out of 26 was 3.8%, whereas Terry's, he had 17 um, PKs and you know, it was 5.8%. Other complications, one case resulted in failure due to rejection, and then one DSEC was doing very good and then had to have a TRAB, and then the endothelial fail, failed in after the TRAB about two, two or three months later. Um, of the 13 eyes that did not have ocular comorbidities or graft failure, 92.3% had better than 20-30 vision, and 30% were better than 20-25. Um, so um, Terry also advocates doing a graph, a DSEC graph that's smaller than the um, PK, whereas we just same size ours, estimating it with calipers during surgery. And here's one of our anterior segment OCTs. You can see the previous PK and then our DSEC graph, which um, did really well. And here's another one. So we're hoping to um, publish this in AJO um, pretty soon. Okay, and then last thing, I have a, I thought this was a really cool um, picture. This is kind of the complete opposite of DSEC. This is a DALC. Um, so in DALC, we've maintained the entire patient's own decime, and we've only transplanted uh, the anterior cornea um, after we've removed the decimates from the donor tissue. So he did great. Um, he had a little bit of a um, posterior tear in the decimates, but it was very small, and it, it and after surgery and post-op day one, he did really good. And then one week later, he said his vision's really blurry, and he came in with this decimase attachment. So we were gonna bring him back the next week, maybe in the Myers room, put an air bubble, see what we could do to save that. But one week later, he had spon spontaneous reattachment, and he actually did really, really good. So in conclusions, DSEC is really one of these landmark innovations in ophthalmology. Um, future advancements, in improving DMEC techniques, looking at outcomes, improved DSEC techniques, and ultimately, you know, cultivated endothelial tra cell transplantations is probably not too far off the horizon. DSEC, our technique with boost and glide and bending incisions really showed really good outcomes with low complications. Non-stripping endothelial keratoplasties effective and failed PKs. And then in these more complicated cases, we have to be mindful of how to manage them um, in that they do have higher rates of graft attachment, glaucoma, and ILL dislocation. So I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Mifflin, Dr. Moshefar, and then um, several medical students and um, uh, Wally and Chris McGriff, who've helped me a lot with the femtosecond laser studies. Yes? There was one other reported case in the literature that um, someone had an open PC after a YAG, um, and then the, the patient had to be rebubbled, and then the lens went back to the back of the to the vitreous. So yeah, I think maybe the air we have to be pretty cautious or see what else it, how what it can do to the lens. Yes. You know, we didn't, we couldn't go near her. Um, so I think maybe if we did, I looked at her other eye with anterior segment OCT, and she, you know, she had not closed air angles, but they were narrow. So possibly doing an LPI or even, yeah. We do. Exactly. Yes.
That would be great. Yes, I can end now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so the FACO D6 and the ones we did with just the non-stripping for the PK, most of those we do topical. Um, but the dial exchange or something we think is going to be longer, we do retrobulbar. Thank you. Thank you.